We're not going to jump straight into the code. We're going to um, look at some clarifications first on um, audio signals and some uh, like simple DSP mathematics for representation of signals. And then we'll start generating some signals in MATLAB. Okay. It's going to full screen. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for your patience with getting set up. Um, this is the first workshop I'm presenting. I've been at ADC for the last five years, I think, as an attendee. But yeah, this is the first time I'm speaking, so really glad to be here. And yeah, thanks for your patience with uh, if we experience any technical issues. So first things first, I'm just going to introduce some mathematical notation for signals. Um, if you have watched the first episode of DSP Corner, I apologize for um, having a recap of some of the same material. It's like when you go and see a comedian and they're doing the same <laughs> sketch every time. Um, this is me. So first is um, continuous time. This is sound in the analog domain, like me speaking right now. And this is the mathematical notation for this is x of t, and you have these round brackets you can see here. And this denotes that it's a continuous time signal. So continuous time sound is a function of amplitude over time. And that's why we have the independent variable t for time in the round brackets there. And on the bottom of the screen on the left here, we've got a representation of a continuous time sine wave. Um, what will represent a continuous time sine wave is that we have a smooth continuous signal with no breaks in it. You would be able to get a value for any given point on the time axis. You would be able to return what value the signal has at that point. And for discrete time or digital sound, we use the square brackets and the independent variable n. And you can see on the bottom of the screen here on the right, we have a representation of a digital signal. And what a digital signal is, is a representation of the continuous time signal. But all we, the only data that we have here to represent it is samples at integer points. And you can see that these are shown by these sort of lollipop-like stems. And the only information that we have for the signal here is we have a value at integer points. So if you <clears throat> wanted a value at, say, like 5.67, you wouldn't be able to get it because you only have values at like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera. Now we're going to cover some properties of sine waves, just to make sure we're all on the same page about what the three main properties are. So the first property is period. This is how long it takes for the signal to complete one cycle before it repeats itself again. You can see that the period for this sine wave is 2 pi, as I've labeled here. And this is a common period for sine waves. And we'll see why that is later. And we can say that this relationship is what makes a signal periodic. So after some period t, it will repeat itself. And this is basically saying that if we add capital T to our signal, we get what we'll have at the original point in our signal. So you can see here at 0 for the sinusoid, we have a value of 0. And if we move 2 pi to the right, we also have a value of 0. And the same if we move to the left for the same period. And yes, in this case, we can say that our period is 2 pi. So if we add 2 pi in either direction, we're going to have the same value. The next property of sinusoids is phase shift. This is basically shift in a vertical direction, either to the left or the right. When we add a phase shift, 
that moves to the left, it's a minus. Um, sorry, to the left, it's a plus because we're bringing the signal forward in time. And when we have a shift that moves to the right, we say it's a minus because we're delaying a signal in time. And we can see the relationship between our red sinusoid and our blue cosine here is that they have this phase difference of pi over 2. And these are the relationships mathematically here. So like I said, you can see that a sinusoid can be described as your cosine, but with a phase shift of minus pi over 2, because that's delaying it in time. And you can see that the cosine can be described as a sinusoid with a phase shift of plus pi over 2. The third property we'll talk about is amplitude. This is a property that's related to the perceptual quality of loudness. The amplitude is measured from 0 to the highest peak in the signal. So we can say that the amplitude for this signal is 1. But a sine wave will oscillate between minus and plus of whatever its amplitude is. So you can see that this sinusoid oscillates between uh, minus 1 and plus 1. And this is denoted with the symbol A usually. Okay, so let's look at the relationship quickly between frequency and period. <clears throat> so we can calculate the frequency as 1 over the period, and we can calculate the period as 1 over the frequency. So you can see that they have this reciprocal inverse relationship. And on the right side of the screen here, I've just got the symbols that are generally used to describe those quantities in signal processing. We'll usually use the lowercase f for frequency in hertz, and we'll use the capital T generally for our period, which is, like I said before, the amount of time that elapses before our signal repeats itself. And we can see here at the bottom that a doubling in frequency causes a halving in period, and a halving in frequency causes a doubling in period. OK, so in a moment, we're going to be opening up MATLAB and generating some sinusoidal waves. So I just want to show you what a sinusoid looks like in terms of mathematics. I've put here the representation for both continuous time at the top of the screen and discrete time at the bottom of the screen. We're going to be looking at what's in the red boxes here. And this will be the uh, regular frequency representation. We can also represent frequency in angular frequency, which is what we've got here on the left hand side. And I've put some conversions at the top of the screen for how we convert back and forth between frequency in hertz and frequency in radians, which is our angular frequency. If we focus on the sinusoidal signal at the top, we can see that it has the round brackets and the independent variable t. And that means that that is a continuous signal, how we write a continuous signal. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see the square brackets and the independent variable n. And that is how we represent a discrete signal. And by its very nature, all the signals we'll be looking at today will be discrete because we'll be computing them. But we're going to try and represent a continuous signal visually for the purposes of demonstrating sampling theorem. And we'll see that in a moment. Again, this is just a simpler representation with some labels. Um, we'll have <coughs> the amplitude usually out in front. And this is, time, this is multiplying the signal by some scalar. And that is increasing or decreasing the amplitude 
based on whether it's larger than one will be increasing the amplitude or smaller than one will be decreasing. And then we have our 2 pi times our frequency in hertz times some time vector, which we'll be generating. And then we can also add a phase shift in a positive or negative direction. And we'll look at adding that as well and, and what that does to our signal. OK, so before we go into looking at sampling a continuous time signal, um, let's look at what is actual continuous time sound. So continuous time sound is a vibration caused by vibrations. It's uh, so it's a form of energy that results from changes in air pressure. And this can be caused by the vibration of a string or the back and forth momentum of a speaker cone, which causes air molecules to compress and expand. And these air pressure changes are picked up by our eardrum and interpreted by our brain as sound. And you can see in this image, which is a, a way of capturing and visualizing air pressure changes, that if you think of the speaker on the left as the source of the sound, we can see these waves that look like ripples coming out. And the darker areas are the areas of compression and the lighter areas are the areas of what we call rarefaction. And I've labeled here on a sine wave how these changes in air pressure look when we plot a signal. So the positive curves of the sine wave are the areas of compression and the negative curves of the sine waves are the areas of rarefaction. OK, so first things first, we'll just look at generating what appears to be a continuous time sinusoidal wave. Like I said, any computer representation of a signal is going to be discrete because we're storing it discreetly on, on a computer. But we can give the impression of a continuous time wave by making the time step very, very small so that the gap between the samples is not perceivable. So first things first, we're going to create a duration, which is in seconds. And that's how long we want our signal to be. And this dt here is our time step. So that's how often we're going to have a sample. Like I said, if we make it incredibly small, then we're going to have a sample very often. And the next thing we need to do is to create a time axis, because we're wanting to plot a function of amplitude over time. So we need to have our time axis upon which we're going to plot our amplitude values. So the syntax in MATLAB here, you can see we've got these colons between the values that we've put here. And we're starting our time axis from 0, time 0. And we're going to our duration of 10 seconds. And then we've got the dt time step in the middle here. So that's between 0 and duration, we're going to have a sample every dt seconds, which is a very small value that we've got here. Next, we want our frequency, which is measured in cycles per second. That's how many cycles of our sine wave we're going to have per one second. So if we have a frequency of 500 and we're generate, <coughs> excuse me, generating 10 seconds, then we're going to have hopefully 5,000 um, cycles of our sine wave. And I've labeled our first sine wave we're generating as x of t. And this is because this is our continuous time representation. And we've got in here what we just saw on our slides, the math. So we've got this sine function. This is a built-in function in MATLAB. So if you haven't used functions before, it's just a way of grouping together a block of code uh, usually, a function will have a single responsibility, so it will do one thing. 
Um, the responsibility of this function is that it computes the sign of a value for us. And we have to specify the value that we're passing in. We have to give it some frequency and some time axis for it to generate that sine wave for us. And then we give it a return type, which is our x of t here. And it's going to return to us a vector, which will contain all of those values for that time series, all of those amplitude values of our sinusoid. And down here, like a lot of code in MATLAB will be plotting code. So all of this in this section is plotting. And what we can do if we want to run just the top bit is highlight it and select run section. I'll just have to zoom out a second there. So you can see that we've plotted the sinusoidal signal that we generated here. And you can see that I've got this x limit. Oh, one second. I can't zoom back in. This is not good. <laughs> there we go. Right. Sorry about the zooming in and zooming out, but I can't find a way to increase the size of the code. When it's here, let's have a go. Nice, thank you. That's really useful. Is this a good size? People online can say, I guess, if, if they're <laughs> struggling to see it. Okay, so we can see that we've generated our sinusoidal signal of 500 hertz. And looking at it now, we can perceive this as a continuous time curve. If we zoomed in very, very close, we would see that they are individual samples. Like I said, we're storing it in a discrete way. But for our purposes here, this looks like a continuous time sinusoid. And what I've done is I've limited the x-axis here to just go between time 0 and 0. <coughs> 0, 1, because if we took that away, then it's going to plot like a <laughs> just a solid color because I'll show you. Quite often we'll limit our axes so that we can visualize our signal a bit better because otherwise if I plot without the limit, we're going to see <laughs> what doesn't look very much like a signal. Maybe if we start zooming in, it's going to look more like a signal. But the purpose of that limiting of the axes is that we're going to be able to visualize it a lot better. Whoa. What's going on? There you go. So you see that's a little bit more like what we just limited it to. But yeah, if you ever are using something like MATLAB and you plot something like a 500 hertz sine wave, then that's going to be a lot of cycles in that very small window. So you might struggle to visualize it and chuck something in like an x limit. That's just limiting our time series on the x-axis. So I'll just put that back to how it was. <coughs> Okay, so if you haven't heard of sampling theorem before, um, this is basically some rules for how often we need to take a snapshot of a continuous time signal in order to capture enough of the information to reconstruct it later on as the exact same signal. So the, the rule of the Nyquist sampling theorem is that we need to sample at at least twice the highest frequency that is present in our original signal. So we can see that our original signal has 500 hertz. 
So the sampling theorem would say in order to reconstruct this signal at the time when it comes to reconstruction, that we would need to sample at at least 1000 hertz. And I think this is a guideline, but generally we'll sample at a higher rate than twice because there are some there are some points in which we'll sample at twice the highest frequency and will be returned nothing because the samples will be taken at points that meet the, the point zero. I'll show you what I mean in a moment. And then when reconstructed, we're just left with a zero amplitude line. So ideally, we want to sample what's sometimes called oversampling. We want to sample at a much higher rate than just double the highest frequency present. So first, I will show you sampling, let's say, at 5,000, which will be 10 times the highest frequency in our original signal. I should mention that if you didn't already know, sinusoids, they only have one frequency. Um, we will look at adding them together so we can combine multiple frequencies. But right now, we have a sinusoid and it just has one frequency present. So what we can see here in green is that we've taken snapshots of the signal at specified times. Because we set our sampling rate, our sampling frequency, this FS here at 5,000, that's 10 times the highest frequency present in the original signal. We can see that we've got these 10 snapshots being taken per cycle. And in the case that the Nyquist theorem states of just taking twice the highest frequency seen in that signal, we would only have two samples per cycle available to represent that signal. So you can imagine if the two samples were taken, say, at point zero, and then halfway through our cycle, that we just have samples going along our midline here. And that wouldn't be any good in, when it came to reconstructing the sound, as we wouldn't have any of the amplitude information. So this is why engineers tend to sample at higher than twice the sample rate and often higher than even three times the sample rate. But I think there's a term of like engineers Nyquist, which is three times the sample rate, which tends to be a, a rule that people go by. OK, so we said we've got 5,000 for the sampling frequency. And we saw in the slides that in order to obtain our sampling period from our sampling frequency, we take the inverse. So we've got this calculation of 1 over the sampling frequency, which gives us our sampling period. And then what we've got to do is create another axis. This time it's not a time axis. It's an axis of all our samples. So again, we're going from 0 to 10 because we want 10 seconds or what was 10 seconds of our continuous time signal. But we want our samples to be taken every ts seconds. So we now have this as our time step. And when we create our discrete time sinusoid, all we're doing is we're swapping out the time axis for our sample axis, which is n. And it's, uh, it's good practice to, to label your plots. So um, we can put, actually, a label for the, we use something called xlabel to label our x-axis in MATLAB. So the continuous time would have time in seconds. And its y-axis would be amplitude. And then we can just grab this here. 
And for our discrete time signal, we can say that we've got samples instead of time. And the variable n. And once we've added them, we can plot these again with the labels. Please bear with MATLAB. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just try closing this in a minute again. You can see that we've got some labels, but we're just waiting for the second plot. Uh, one thing I'll mention is that there's this um, function in MATLAB called subplot, and that's what's allowed us to plot our, our signals all on the same figure. So you can see that our first plot, in subplot you say how many rows you want, how many columns you want, and then what number that plot will be. So we've got our first one as we're saying we want a figure with three rows, one column, and this will be our first plot on that figure. Okay, I'm just going to run the whole thing. And then we'll talk about reconstruction. Okay. So I'll talk about how we obtain the signal at the bottom of our screen here. Sorry. And I said that if we take a certain number of signals, a certain number of samples for our continuous time, sinusoid, we will be able to accurately reconstruct that signal when it comes to the reconstruction stage. And because we have taken a sampling frequency that is well over the highest frequency seen in our original signal, we should be able to accurately reconstruct that signal. And the red signal you can see at the bottom of the screen here is the reconstruction. And the way that we've achieved this is by reconstructing a time axis based on the maximum number of samples that we have in our sampled signal. And we've used something called interpolation. And the simplest way I can describe interpolation is joining the samples that we've taken together. And there's lots of different ways of joining them, the most common being linear interpolation, where you're just drawing a straight line between the samples and sort of connecting the dots. But we've gone for this type of um, interpolation called spline. And if we look at the docs for um, MATLAB in one, so if you're like <clears throat> doing some signal processing in MATLAB, the docs are going to be incredibly useful for you because you're going to be able to see like what different arguments you can pass into those functions. You're going to get a description of what is achieved with this function and the different methods you can use. There's also some visualizations, some code examples, so you can see exactly what type of thing you're going to get in your output. And you can see this is the linear interpolation that I mentioned. So if you think of these blue points as the samples that we just took from our sinusoidal signal, then the interpolation is happening in a linear manner between them. And we're just really like filling in the gaps here. But this doesn't look very nice in terms of what we're going for. We want a smoother transition between those points. So we've gone for this 
spline interpolation. And you can see that looks much more similar to what we're originally going for. And then I'll just jump back to MATLAB. So yeah, we can see if we compare the signals at the top and the bottom of our plots, then these look identical, which is what we're going for. Now let's try sampling at a rate that does not meet the Nyquist criteria. So let's go and change our sampling frequency. And let's choose 600, because this is not near double our sampling frequency. We need at least 1,000 to be within that Nyquist range. And let's try plotting that. OK, so we can see that something weird's happened here when we've tried to sample at a rate that is under the Nyquist sampling theorem rate. And First, let's look at the samples that we've taken. So because we've sampled at 600, that means that we're taking fewer than two samples per cycle of our sine wave. So it's not giving a very valid representation. We're not picking up any of the, the oscillation up here, here. And what we've found is that by sampling at this lower rate, we've introduced a signal of a different frequency. We can see that in the reconstruction, it still looks like a sinusoidal signal, but it's at a different frequency, a much lower frequency. And this issue that we run into when we don't sample at a high enough sampling frequency is called aliasing. And it introduces frequencies that weren't present in the original signal. And this is why it's so important to, to sample at a rate which can accurately capture the movement that we have in whichever signal we're sampling. And of course, this is just a sinusoidal signal. Signals that we're working with in real life will be much more complex generally. But the reason I like to show this for sinusoids is that actually many signals that we can think of can be broken down into an uh, infinite series of sinusoidal signals, all with different amplitude and frequency components. So if we can understand these concepts for something as simple as a sinusoid, then we can apply them to more complex signals. Oh. Hi there. Uh, so I was somewhat familiar with the Nyquist theorem, and uh, I'm interested to see when you change like fs to like frequency times two that the yeah. the reconstruction isn't good. Wouldn't that mean that the Nyquist theorem is? Yeah, this is what I was saying. So, um, it's not always. Yeah, I would say like exactly twice is not a good representation, and that's why like oversampling tends to be best practice. If you think about the sampling rate that we use for, say, um, a lot of audio that we'll see on our computers or for CD quality, we use 44,100 hertz. And the reason for that is that the human hearing range goes between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. So you've got that number that's a bit higher than, than double the maximum sound or the maximum frequency that we're able to hear. And in most cases, you're not going to have frequencies like pushing like 20,000 hertz in your signals. So that's actually a fair amount of room for maneuver with that one. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone has any uh, 
further like input on sampling it exactly twice and like why people why yeah <laughs> why that scene is um uh, so generally, it's the lowest you can possibly get away with. So if you go above that, you're using more computing space, basically. So you actually see in some modern studios, they will sample at 88, 400 hertz instead. So they will double again. But when you do that, obviously, you're space limited to whatever hard drives you've got, basically. I mean, when you record, it takes so much space. And then if you're recording a whole album and then say you're working on a laptop to produce it, it's going to kill your laptop. So I think... By observing Nyquist and doing the lowest possible, you get away with that. And audio files will hear a difference, I think. I've never been able to. I've tried. I've really tried to do that. And I've listened in an audio booth. But the lowest possible you can get away with is 44100, I think. Maybe you can drop it if you want and stuff. But it's all to save space, basically. But obviously, when you're working with a sine wave, that's not really a problem here. This is just like a second, so it's fine. Um, also gives you extra room for your anti-aliasing exactly. filter. So you've got yeah. both sides, you've got a bit of space, exactly. Yeah, we were saying before, <clears throat> it's actually quite hard to like demonstrate aliasing because in all the products we use, like uh, audio processing software, they, there's anti-aliasing filters which are built into um, the analog to digital conversion. So you won't really run into aliasing um, that often, ideally, because there's so many steps well, along the until way. Until you start program. programming and then you go, ooh, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, unless yeah. you're like writing your own plugins, perhaps. So I realise that I don't know how familiar people are with the, the MATLAB interface, but I'll, I'll just do some sort of housekeeping and um, clear up like what we have over this side of the screen. Do I need to? <laughs> What's going on here? I think I think we're good. We can. Yeah. We're just looking over here. Yeah. So <laughs> over on the the left hand corner at the bottom of the screen. Oh no! I need to go further over. Sorry about this. Maybe I need to zoom out. Do, 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 do. Oh no, that's not good. I'm just trying to get my variables back. <laughs> oh, mate, there we go. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, everyone. I was double zoomed. <laughs> okay. So what we can look at is um, we'll have our all our variables that we've created stored over here in what's called our workspace. And if we don't assign our variables to a variable like we have here, like F or FS, if we don't give it a name, then we will be left with this thing called ANS, which is uh, stands for answer in MATLAB. So if you compute something, if you pop up the command window at the bottom here and you need to calculate something Oh no, the zooming is, there we go. Command window is here. Right, so what you can do in your command window is you can do some calculations um, without necessarily having it in a script. So you can work things out pretty quickly and get the answers without running your whole script. So say we wanted to get like our sampling period, we could chuck that in here. Uh, FS. and that will come up as this ANS. So that means it's just saved as our current answer. Like if we do something else in here, then that's going to become our ANS. Like if we create a time series, that could be to look at. So I'll just show that syntax again. You can see that that's how we create a time series, say, between 0 and 10 in a step of 1. We don't actually have to put that 1 in there. If you just put 0 to 10, 1 will be used as the default step for any time series you create. And, um, yeah, that's uh, 
I was going to do the with our step, but that's going to create many, many values because we have a very high resolution time series for our continuous signal. But I just wanted to show that you can do some calculations in your command window here. And unless you assign them to a variable, you're just going to have them as this ANS variable. So the way that digital signals are represented in a computer are as these indexable vectors, usually of floating points. And we can have a look, let's say, x of t to see what they look like. Yeah, so if you double click anything in your workspace here, it's going to pop up on this side of your screen. And you can see that this is a vector of indexed uh, floating point values. And these are actually the amplitude values of your sine wave. So you're starting at 0. You can see we're increasing and then decreasing down at 0. And you are seeing that oscillation between 1 and minus 1. Um, one quirk of MATLAB compared to other programming languages is that indexes from one, <laughs> as you can see here. This can be confusing when moving between MATLAB and um, I think it's all other programming languages, if not. <laughs> is there another one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's um what it will mean is that sometimes when you're you're say like generating a signal. Um, sample by sample or applying a filter, you might have to like add one or minus one here and there to make sure you're, you're starting at zero. Um, but yeah, it's just something to keep in mind if you're working with MATLAB that we index from one instead of zero. Is everyone okay then if we go ahead with like a little uh, demo of how we'd add sinusoids of other frequencies. OK. First thing we need to do is add another frequency variable. So we can call this f1. And you can choose a number that you would like for, for the frequency. Maybe you want to make it a bit of a higher frequency than what we've got here, so that you can add some smaller oscillations into the signal when you add them together. You could go for a double if you want, or you could go for a lower frequency, completely up to you. <clears throat> the only thing that we will have to keep in mind, of course, is that if we add a higher frequency to our sinusoid, what's going to happen is the highest frequency present in our resulting signal is going to be the the higher of the two, so the 1,000. So we'll have to adjust our sampling frequency to accommodate for this. But we'll, we'll get to that when we've added them together. I think in this case, we've got, we were sampling at 5,000. So this would be fine to, uh, to capture an 1,000 hertz sinusoid, but we'll see. Uh, Okay, so we need a second frequency and we need a second sinusoid. So X2T, really creative naming conventions here. X2T, please use better names than me. Um, the reason I'm using X is like I said, like input signals are generally notated as X in any digital signal processing literature that you're going to come across. So it's just making you aware of if you're jumping into a textbook, um, X is going to be generally what you'll see as an input signal, and Y is what you're going to generally see as an output signal. And when we create a delay in a while, then we'll see that we have Y as our output signal. So all we're going to do is create another sine wave, but this time we're going to chuck in our second frequency. <coughs> and what we could do is 
just adjust our subplot a little bit so that we can visualize these. So if we change three to four, so we can have four signals, four rows of signals here. And let's create another subplot down here. And this is going to be our second one. And we can plot x2 of t. Just change the variable here to make sure we're grabbing the second signal that we created. And let's put all of our labels too. With plotting code, you can more or less just like copy and paste it, change up the title if you want to, change up the, the labels of the axes if you need to. And I'm just going to jump down here and make sure that we've changed these subplots as well. Three. And this is going to be four rows and our fourth plot. OK. So first things first, I'm just going to plot that other sinusoid of the higher frequency. Hopefully this will work first time. <clears throat> Great. So we can see that this sinusoid has double the frequency of the original one that we plotted, because in the time it takes for the top one to um, travel one cycle, this one has two cycles. One, two. OK, let's add them together. And all we're going to do to add them together is, um, let's just call it x. And what, <coughs> excuse me, what we're going to do is just literally add x of t and x2 of t. So x of t. <coughs> Just using the plus symbol. Brilliant. And then what we'll do, I don't know why I put up this one. What we'll do is that instead of plotting x2 of t in our second space here, we'll change that just to x so we can see what those two signals look like added together. I'm just going to see if I can maximize this. Cool. So we can see that what adding two sinusoids does is it creates a slightly more complex signal. You've got some of those higher frequency oscillations coming into our original 500 hertz signal, and it's causing us to have more variation in the amplitude of our signal. And you can imagine if that you are started adding more and more sinusoidal components with different frequencies and different amplitudes, you're going to start to achieve a more and more complex signal and something similar to what we might see in, say, like a speech signal or a guitar or something that has um, many frequency components within it. And let me just close this down. Restore. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so we can see that. Oh, that <laughs> good learning experience for this one is that um, what we've done here, the samples that we've taken have, like I said, had that phenomenon where they plot just along the midline. So the representation that we're getting on the output is not good. And that's because we forgot to change our sampling frequency here. So uh, the highest frequency in our signal now is 1,000 hertz, and we're using a sampling period of, um, of 1,000 hertz, so that's no good. What I will do as well is that down here, we're going to plot, we're going to change x of t to x. 
so that we're, we're plotting it here as well and capturing the right signal. And okay, let's change the sampling rate to something much higher and see what we get. Oh, just need to X of M T R. Oh, this one. Oh, here. Oh, I see. Um, so taking X of M. So I need to sample. Uh, sorry, one second. Yes. Anna, what do I need to change here to um to capture the Oh. Two, and the Thank you, had a <laughs> sign to, yeah. yeah, sorry everyone had a bit of a blank there, signs, <laughs> you, you looked so scared, I was like, no. okay, <clears throat> okay, let's try that again, and then, yeah, let's see if that works. Mm -hmm. Yay. <laughs> okay, so we can see that we've um, managed to reproduce the signal that we've got here. Yeah, sorry everyone, I forgot to mention like when, the, when sampling as well, you need to also add them together. Um, what I could have done here is created like I did above, like x of, what did I call it up here? x of 2n. So this is equivalent to, to writing this and then putting this down here. So you can do it in one line. Or you can do it like we did before where we make a variable for each sine wave this time the sample time waves, and then let's call this, oh, I'm running out of <laughs> names, um, x1. This is our sampled signal, and we can just say x of n plus x of 2. Hmm. And then down here, let's just make that x of 2 n. x of 1, sorry. This is why naming is important. Oh no. Uh, oh. Um, sorry, I changed it in the wrong place. Uh, plot x of one. Oh no, we want x instead. X. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. And then down here, I need to change this to X font. Sorry about this, maybe I shouldn't have <laughs> changed anything. <clears throat> I think that should be fine now. Great, we're back where we were. Yeah, sometimes when you change one variable, you need to like start going down and changing everything. So <clears throat> it can be, yeah, however you feel comfortable, whether you want to declare it all in one line or to have your individual variables and then add the signals together. It's just whatever works for you. Um, I'm going to do a quick, like, MATLAB check over um, while they're doing a sound check. So the questions I've been ask, uh, answering while we've been going through that first script have been a few sort of housekeeping matlab -y things, and then I realised that we didn't really explain MATLAB at the start very well. So first of all, I want to say a huge thanks to MATLAB for giving us these licenses and supporting us. They're our good friends, and as you can see, it's a great software to use for this thing. So the first thing I saw um, was, uh, obviously, a lot of people have experience in C++, so they're adding these semicolons here. In MATLAB, that doesn't do the same thing as C++. In MATLAB, you're actually suppressing it in the command line. So if you want to try that, take the semicolon off a variable, run your script, you'll see that the answer will come out. And that's what you're seeing. So the only reason I mention that is when you're plotting, don't add that semicolon because it won't, <laughs> it won't show. And then MATLAB will go, ah, oh, you don't want anything from me. So it's, it's technically doing what it's meant to do. But at the same time, I've spent hours doing things like that. Like, you're like, why isn't it plotting? Is my array size wrong? Have I defined a function wrong? No, you've just added a semicolon. It's like the opposite row around to C++. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, when you're plotting these signals and you're moving between the continuous time and the discrete time, so T and N, make sure that you're defining the arrays to be the same size on the X and Y axis axis because MATLAB doesn't like different sized arrays. Sometimes it will give you an error that if you've seen it before, you know what it's doing. It'll be like, array is the wrong size. I don't like it. But sometimes it won't. And you'll just get a blank screen. And you're like, how do, I, how do you de debug that if you're new to MATLAB? So when we were doing those added sine waves, when you're working with the continuous edition, make sure t is defined in your functions. And when you're in the discrete, make sure that you're using n, basically. Uh, all the changes that Rachel just made, I've now uploaded onto the GitHub. Let me know if there's any problems. I will try and go through as we're going through this. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand back to Rachel. Let's carry on. Right, so for the second section, we're going to be looking at analyzing the frequency content of a signal. And of course, for this demonstration, we've been computing our own signals. So we know what frequencies we're giving them. We're defining them like we did as our F variable, or when we have multiple sinusoids, call them F1, F2, et cetera. So we already know which frequencies in Hertz that we're creating these sine waves with. But we might be in a case where we have some audio that we haven't computed ourselves, and we want to analyze the frequency content of it. And for all types of reasons, we might want to uh, remove certain frequencies or attenuate certain frequencies, boost certain frequencies. And we can do this by evaluating in what's called the frequency domain. So everything we've seen so far is in the time domain, and we're seeing a function of amplitude over time, and that's, that's what we're visualizing in the time domain. We've got what we call our waveform quite often. And once we move to the frequency domain, we're going to be seeing what the contribution of each sinusoid, sinusoidal component, let's call it, in our signal has to the overall signal. So what is the, the magnitude of that specific frequency, uh, which corresponds to the amplitude of that specific frequency? And at what frequency is that sinusoidal component present? So we're just going to start off with just, again, one sine wave. We're getting used to this now because we've plotted a few. Um, this time, we're going straight from starting with the sampling rate and 
grabbing our um, duration, 1.5 seconds here we've got, our sampling period, so the duration between each sample. This again looks quite continuous because we've sampled at a much higher rate than what our frequency is. We've got frequency of 30 here. Say that I raise this, we would see that that is looking not as continuous as what it would had we had a higher sampling frequency. Sorry, MATLAB again. <laughs> Good. Yeah, you can see this looks much more unpleasant. Um, and that's because we we do have those like, fewer sampling points to represent the signal. It's the same signal just plotted um, slightly weirdly because we don't have all those points to create that smooth oscillation of the sinusoid. So let's bring that back to 30. So it looks nice again. <laughs> Any time now. OK. So first thing we're going to do is verify that we're getting that frequency that we've created this as. So what we're expecting to see in the frequency domain is a spike at the frequency of 30. And our we haven't looked at changing the amplitude of our sinusoids yet. But do you remember I said in the slides that the amplitude comes out in front here and it's a scalar that multiplies the signal and that increases or decreases the amplitude? So at the moment, we've essentially just got one times the amplitude. I don't have to put that, but I'm just going to put it for clarity. And then we can change this in a moment and see like, what is the, the magnitude of the sinusoidal component that we have. OK. I've just commented out some code here, but I'm going to uncomment it. First thing we're going to do is take the Fourier transform. First step. And I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with comments in code, but in MATLAB, to write a comment, you use the percentage sign, as you can see that I've done a lot throughout these scripts. And what happens is that when the code is evaluated, those comments won't be taken into consideration. They're just there for you and other developers to write some comments to tell, remind yourself quite often, because I forget as soon as I close projects what I've written about, and remind other people what the content of your code does um, and any quirks that I might have. And a shortcut you can use um, on Mac is command, um, is this forward slash, backslash? Sorry, <laughs> that's forward slash. <laughs> command forward slash or control forward slash. You'll comment, you'll um, like grab what you want to comment out, and then command forward slash. And then to uncomment, you can use these up here. So that will comment. You can actually just use these, I guess. That will comment and that will uncomment. Just a, for clarity there. OK, so I'm going to comment out everything below the taking of the Fourier transform here, just so I don't plot it. But you don't have to, just in case you want to do it step by step. Let's run this again. <coughs> I'm going to take, I'm actually going to make this a cosine. Um, yeah, sorry to, can everyone, can everyone change the, the signal from sine to cosine on line 20, on line 20. Uh, just for the purposes of the demonstration, I wanted to show both sinusoid, they're all, both sinusoidal components, but like we explained at the beginning, the cosine is a phase shifted version of a sinusoidal component and vice versa. Now I'm going to run the FFT. <coughs> X. X. 
I'm still getting assigned. Can you watch it? Oh. That's weird. I haven't added a phase shift. Oh, yeah, that's weird. Yeah. MATLAB said no. <laughs> what I might do is just um, clear. Close. Okay. I'm just going to rerun this because MATLAB wasn't picking up that I'd changed that to a cosine and still isn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so usually this, this point at one would be at zero for a cosine. Um, not sure why that hasn't changed. Yeah, give it a go. I'll just save it and run it again just to check. Otherwise, we'll move on. Okay, we're still plotting. Right, let's take a look at some values that we've got for our signal x. And we can do that in here by using array indexing. Oh dear, Where's our zoom out. There we go. So we can say x, and then we can grab some values of x. So we could say we want values 5 through to 10. And we just write it like that. So we're grabbing indexes 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 there. And you can see the floating point numbers that I described earlier. So the reason we're checking some values of our sinusoidal signal is because this is a real signal, which means we have real numbers. So these are decimal numbers, but they're very much real numbers, which are the numbers that we're used to seeing most often in everyday life. And if I check out some of the values of the fast forward transform that we just performed on our signal, these are going to be slightly different. So I'll just grab, I think, like, 20, let's say 30 through 40, because we know we have um, a component somewhere around here in terms of frequency. But also, it's going to be in frequency bins, so I'll describe this as well, what it means. So you can see that with the output of our Fourier transform, that these numbers look a little different to what we saw with the real numbers. So for each of these, we have what we call a complex number. And a complex number is a number that is made up of a real portion and an imaginary portion. Sorry, the command window. Um, and the reason that the fast Fourier transform output is complex is that each value of the Fourier transform has both magnitude information and phase information. And the real number that we see in the output of the fast Fourier transform is our magnitude information. And the imaginary part that we see is our phase information. So both of these numbers can tell us information about our signal. The real number can tell us at what magnitudes our frequencies are present. Um, and the imaginary number can tell us what the phase information is of our input signals. Just going to comment out this. So what we can do is we can grab each of those numbers from out of our FFT output to get individually the magnitude information and the phase information. So first what we can do is we can grab xmag, and we use this function called abs, 
which means taking the absolute value, which will give us the magnitude of our FFT output. And to get the angle, we can use this function angle, which gets us the imaginary part, and that is the phase information of our signal. Okay, I'm just going to plot the magnitude plot now. Yeah. Oh, finally, we have a cosine as well. Thanks for joining the room. <laughs> okay, we need a bit more zoom on this. So I'm just going to maximize it. Okay, so what you're seeing here is our the magnitude of our FFT output. So we've plotted the magnitude information. And you can't see very much going on here, but you can see these lines on either side of the spectrum. And one is pretty close to zero down that end of the frequency spectrum. And one is much closer to sort of um, the other end of the frequency spectrum, like the higher end. And what we're interested in is the left side of this plot. So if you split it down the middle, we're interested in the information on the left side right now. And what we haven't done yet is we haven't scaled our axes to be in terms of frequency. So when we take a discrete signal and we move from the time domain to the frequency domain, instead of samples n, we're going to be having um, what we call bins. So each of these integer values at the bottom here, I've labeled the axis as frequency bins. And the length of your FFT will be exactly the same unless otherwise specified as the signal that you pass in. So whatever the length of the signal is that you passed in in samples, you're going to get the same number of frequency bins when you transform into the frequency domain. Now let's zoom in on the left-hand side here and uh, see what we can see. So might be a bit confused first time seeing the frequency domain, frequency bins, um, and understanding, like, OK, this looks like it's showing up. We zoom in further. We're looking for a frequency of 30, and this is 46. So that's not correct in terms of the frequency we were expecting. But we are seeing one frequency component, um, which is what we're expecting. The reason you've got one at the other end is because the components are mirrored over your Nyquist frequency. So whatever your frequency is on this side, you're going to have another spike on the mirrored side of your Nyquist frequency that's going to be at the same point in a mirror image. And we can say, OK, this, this frequency is present at bin 46. And right now, the only sort of information we can gather, which is often enough if you're analyzing sound for the purposes of you're trying to see where's the spectral energy lying in that frequency spectrum. And we can see just from looking at this plot that we have some spectral energy in the lower portion of our spectral plot. So we can see, OK, there's, there's some low frequency, frequency component present. Now we're going to remember what bin this was present at, which is 46. And we're going to make a note of that. Um, because we want to analyze the phase information. Right now, we haven't added any phase plus or minus. But what we can do, write that down, that we have one at 46, frequency bin. And let's jump back up here to our signal and add some phase shift. So we put it just after the time, um, the time series calculate multiplication. And we can add a plus or minus here. So let's say we want to add a phase shift of 1.5 there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to rerun. Um, 
That's crazy that it took so long to change from a sign to a go sign. I can't get over it. I know, like you're looking at me like, like, she really doesn't know what she's doing. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah. Okay, the reason the signal looks different is because we've added a phase shift. Wonderful. So that worked properly. And we'll just double check that we're still seeing our frequency component at the same frequency bin. Looks like we are. Let's just verify that. Yeah, so we've got something at 46. Um, these are little icons up here, as you might have noticed I'm using. You can click them to zoom in, zoom out. Um, grab parts of your signal, move it around, explore it, and um, yeah, save. You can also like save the plot to your MATLAB online if you want to keep them. Okay, so what we can do now, let's just open up our command window. And before we do that, just remember that we took the X phase as the angle of the FFT output. So that gives us all our phase information. So what we can do is we can go into our command window and we can grab X phase, which is our phase information, and we can pass in the number or the index where we found that um, frequency component. And we can see that our phase shift is here, it's slightly different number to what we're expecting, but around 1.5. Maybe I put that slightly wrong. But generally, you should be able to yeah, grab the phase information and then index it with the number frequency bin that that frequency is at. And that should give you the phase at that point. Let's just try changing the phase once more and see if that's I'm right in thinking this. Maybe let's add a minus now, so like X phase. OK, there's some um, slight rounding errors, but we're getting like more or less similar phase to, to what we put in for those ones. What we're going to do now is what we did before. We're going to um, either uncomment or create your own frequency components or sinusoidal components with different frequencies. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to comment out this X. One second, I've just lost control of my mouse. <laughs> Love it. OK, I'm going to uncomment. If you want to uncomment lines 14 through 18 by using the, um, the one with the little blue icon at the top here, we're going to be using these three sinusoidal components instead of just our original pure tone. We're going to be adding them together to create a more complex signal again. And we're going to see if we can then visualize that three frequency components are appearing in our magnitude plot. So let's give that a run. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> being better. <laughs>
Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, good catch. Oh yeah, so what I would have been having is a, an error here. So if something isn't working for any reason, the errors come up in the command window. So just as I missed there, like it's really easy to miss the error and like think, okay, well, like why isn't anything happening? But if you open up the command window, then um, you should have an error there if you're not getting the expected behavior. And I think on like the MATLAB a desktop, this is more obvious because you'll have you can set it up in a way that you have your command window just visible there at the bottom, and you'll see the error straight away. But because we're, we're very space limited, <laughs> I've just got it. Yeah, at the bottom there. Cool. So we've got a slightly different. Yeah. Somebody is asking why um, is the frequency showing at the index for the six? Maybe we can reiterate again. Like yeah. Yeah. Sure. So. It's not the frequency, but the frequency. Again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's actually a good point, and I'll show um, in one moment just how to. Um, I'll repeat the question first. Sure. So someone asks, like, why is the frequency showing at bin 46 instead of, like, shouldn't it be at 30 where we expected it to be? So the frequency bins that we obtain, they're not actually um, scaled yet to show us like, exactly the frequencies that we're um, seeing in our signal. We're going to see how to scale that axis in a moment so that hopefully we can see at the exact frequencies that these sinusoidal components are oscillating at. But for now, when you take the magnitude spectrum, all you can see is like at what, at what point in the spectrum is their spectral energy. And this is done in frequency bins. And you can decide the length that you want your FFT to be because we haven't passed any second variable into our um, FFT. You could pass in a second variable here and say how long you want your FFT to be. But we've just passed in x. So our FFT is going to be the same length as whatever our signal is. And our signal was um, 30. Yeah, I think the original one was 30 hertz. And we were taking, I think, 1.5 seconds. So it's like. 40, 45 samples. Um, and yeah, we're going to, let me just show you actually how to like scale <laughs> the frequency axis and then it will become more obvious, hopefully. So I'm going to uncomment just this stuff down here. So I've got a bit of an explanation above frequency axis here as to how this scaling is going to happen. So it says, next, calculate the frequency axis, which is defined by the sampling rate. Basically, we're saying we want fs number of equally spaced values between 1 and minus 1 and 1. But we're putting our Nyquist frequency out in front to multiply this time series. Because ultimately, what we want is n number of points between minus our Nyquist frequency and plus our Nyquist frequency. So if we're sampling at a rate of 1,000, <laughs> our Nyquist frequency is going to be 1,000 divided by 2, which is 500. So we want frequency points between minus 500 and plus 500, because these, with that sampling frequency, these are the band of frequencies that we can represent and reconstruct from our signal. So Linspace creates a linear, linearly spaced um, vector. I can show a little example in the command window. So you'll say the arguments that you put in are where you want it to start, where you want it to end, and what you want the step to be. So we could say 0 0.5. And then it's going to, oh, one second, it's uh, in space, one times empty vector, I don't know.
one time is like two over two now. Hmm. Why is this not working? <laughs> Just trying to demonstrate what Lin space does by getting this empty. Okay, maybe I'll just create it and then... The third argument is the number of steps, not the, in uh, the interval of it. I see. Sorry about that. Okay, so number of steps, let's say, is just going to be 10. Well, I think if we... Yeah, if you take it out, then it's just going to create um, equally spaced values between what you set your lower and upper limit to be. But you can also pass in... 200 huh? is the default. Okay. Yeah, 100 values is the default that it will create. Like 100 equally spaced values between your lower and upper limit. Um, and that's 10. So yeah, if you pass in 10, then it's going to create 10 values between 1 and 10. So when we create the frequency axis, Capital N is the length of our FFT. Let's just uncomment that. And that's the length in samples, uh, or frequency bins in this case, because we, we've already transferred to the frequency domain. And what we're just saying is that we want FS over 2, which in, in this case is 500, times our linear, linearly spaced minus one to one. So that means it will be a time series of minus 500 to 500 with a time step of, with n elements between the top and lower, the top and bottom limit. So I'm just going to create the frequency axis and then let's apply the FFT shift. And what the FFT shift will do is it will center our frequencies around zero rather than seeing like zero at the very beginning of our frequency spectrum and having the Nyquist in the middle and then the upper end of our frequency spectrum being the sampling frequency. We want to have it centered around zero so it's a bit easier to read. And then I'm just going to uncomment all of this and we should be able to visualize our frequencies. Okay. Unrecognized variable. Yeah, you probably forgot to comment something there. I've got N. Uh, run it again, trim the command. It's like before when it's not picking up something that I've changed. Okay, let's have a look. So I've got N there. It plotted it first, but then, one second, we're just having a bit of trouble with MATLAB catching up again. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So we've got X, we've got... You've got, got all the variables. What's on mine? Okay. I think everything's there. <laughs> it just I needs time. It is all there. It is a calculator. Okay, let's run again. Yeah, I'll just try and like clear everything. I'm running that up. So, uh, 
Let's just try again and then I'll check in another file. Ooh. How have you changed that song right now? Have you really changed it all? Sorry about this, guys. One second. I'm just going to try pasting it into another file. Okay. Clear your... Yeah, I tried clearing. <laughs> New file. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. So here we can see three spikes, which is promising, promising times. Um, so yeah, let's look at our magnitudes. We can see that, yeah, these we created our frequencies at, what was it, 20, 30, and 40. And here, that's not really lining up. Like I said before, these aren't representative of the frequencies. All we can tell from this is, okay, there's there's three. So yeah, let's actually see like what you'd be able to tell from this. Um, let's maximize it. If I was looking at this, um, just like as it, oh, oh my gosh, it's freezing so much. OK. Yeah, just as it shows up here with, with the three spikes in the, the lower range of the frequency spectrum, what I would be able to see is that I've got some lower range frequency components in my signal here. And what I'd be able to tell from this is that I have my signal with the middle frequency, or F mid, sometimes called, then this has one half of the upper frequency that we're seeing and one third magnitude of the lowest frequency component that we're seeing. And that gives us some information about the signal. And it might be all that we need if we're analyzing like where the power lies and at what contribution each frequency is having. But if we go down here, we've done our FFT shift and we've done our frequency axis scaling. So with any luck, and we haven't had much of it with MATLAB today, <laughs> if we zoom in, as grateful as we are for MATLAB uh, sponsoring this, we zoom in here. Now our positive frequency components are on the right side because we've shifted our spectrum. Yeah, <laughs> you can see that. You can see that um, if I if I minimize this down, you can see that our highest amplitude frequency is our x of one, which has a frequency of twenty hertz. You can see that our mid frequency has an amplitude of one, and it is at 30 hertz here on the frequency axis. And you can see that our frequency of 40 has an amplitude of 2. And the way that I have got this amplitude axis to be scaled to show the exact amplitudes that we're seeing is that when I plotted it, I divided by our Nyquist um, so not our Nyquist, our half the length of our FFT. And that gave us this scaled amplitude axis. So there's ways of scaling the x-axis and there's ways of scaling the y-axis. And by dividing by this value here, we scaled the y-axis. If I take that away, then we'll see still the magnitude components like we have up here. But when we add that, we, we scale it down to show those actual amplitude values. Uh, one question. Uh, mm -hmm. It was mentioned before, but maybe people need a repetition. Sure. Why, why are the, um, uh, where's the uh, spectrum mirror? Oh, why is the spectrum mirror? On the, the FFT? Like where, where do you have um, because the 
whichever frequency components we have are um, reflected over our Nyquist. I'm not sure, like, 100%. It's just what is the, yeah. It's, yeah, we have this, like, um, symmetry whenever we move to the frequency domain, we have a symmetry over the whatever our Nyquist is of the frequency spikes. But the this is a good point as well for aliasing, because what will happen if we don't sample at a high enough frequency is that things will start to get mirrored back into the Nyquist range. So if we're approaching, we're getting close to that Nyquist frequency, then frequencies that weren't present in our original signal are going to start to be mirrored back across that. And I was going to suggest an exercise of verifying the um, alias frequency that we're getting in our um, aliasing code, sampling code, now that we know how to grab our frequency spectrum. But I think... I might be running out of time for my segment just because of the, the slow, <laughs> the slow loading of MATLAB um, and a few technical difficulties. But maybe that's something like people could have as like a takeaway exercise. I also didn't get to cover the delay code, but maybe I'll we'll. Yeah. I'll be covering yeah, that yeah. Much. Harriet's going to be speaking about delay lines, so um, yeah, you've got the delay code. Um, if you're interested in knowing a bit more about that or have any questions, you can always come and grab me over lunch or yep. Yep. ask right. questions at any time. Thank you, Rachel. So I've got 40 minutes with you guys now to talk about filters a little bit. What I'm going to do is introduce the difference between an FIR and an IIR filter, and that's probably as far as we're going to get today. Um, and then we're going to do sort of 20 minutes of theory. I've put quite a lot of maths on the board, but don't worry. We don't need to understand it to a higher level yet. I just want you to be able to take something away or maybe play with the MATLAB scripts, play with the slides, and sort of understand how it all fits together, basically. So without further ado, let's play Where's My Mouse? OK. How many of us are music producers at heart, right? Everyone knows what a filter does. Exactly. Thank you, thank you. We all know what a filter does. We're changing the frequency response of our input signal. So here are some common ones. I'm sure you've all used it, like those sweeping intros for your lo-fi demos, as I just displayed for you there. So there are four common types. How do we implement those? There are a couple of different ways we can do that. So if you're working with an EQ, that might look a little bit different, because you want different accuracy on that and stuff. All right, so here's an example of a low-pass frequency response. So Given this digital system, determine the frequency response. That's ugly, isn't it? Like, what the hell is that? So let's break this down a little bit. And I'm going to move over to the whiteboard, actually, so I can go into a bit more detail with you. Um, so for anyone not aware, this is called a difference equation. Um, is anyone colorblind before I pick a color? All right, if we have any issues looking at the whiteboard, please let me know. So I'm going to write this out. Should have done it before, shouldn't I? Drop the X. All right, so this is possibly the simplest filter I could think to show you guys. Uh, as I've outlined here, we've got our input, output, and previous input signal. So this output here is getting affected by this and this. These numbers here, these 0.5s, these are known as coefficients. So these are arbitrary numbers at the front of these signals. And what that will do will affect the frequency, basically. So I'm going to step through now how we go from that into something we can plug into MATLAB and we can see that happening. So let's do that. I'm also going to mention a, a third dimension, but we don't need to worry about that just yet. It's ugly. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the first thing we do is go into this thing called the Z domain. Um, we don't need to go into details on the Z domain today. I will spare you that. But as you can see, what we've done is added Z to this equation. And where it says n minus 1, we've dropped it to Z to the power of minus 1. 
Um, this is because numbers are complex, basically. Um, a good thing to remember is the transfer function hz is equal to yz over xz. That basically means we can factor x of z to be with y of z. So this is what gives you your filter, hz. Um, so you're left with these coefficients, and we've got z to the minus 1 there. This is going to be ugly again. <laughs> Numbers are complex, right? We know this. They have real parts and imaginary parts. So we don't need to understand what Euler is doing here. But if we refer back to Rachel's slides previously, you'll remember that we played around with sinusoids, cosines, and stuff like that. And as you can see, there is parts of the signal made up of uh, cosines and sines. And the sine is complex because we've got the letter j in front of it. So if you really wanted, you could take these two magnitude and phase responses and put them into MATLAB and see what they do. But don't need to if you don't want to. <laughs> Reiterate that the um, Do you know, Mike. <laughs> that the uh, cosine is the real part of the complex number in Euler's identity, and the sinusoid is the imaginary part. Okay. So yeah. as we know, things are made up of sines and cosines, basically. But again, <laughs> we actually want to get to playing with these filters today, so I won't bore you with that. So. This is what this looks like plotted. So it's observed that when the frequency increases, the magnitude response decreases, basically. So it's acting like a digital low pass filter, very common. Uh, the filter, so a filter cutoff, you'll hear a lot of the cutoff point. That's where we see the signal attenuated by three decibels. And that's where I drew that really bad arrow. Um, yeah. So this is a low pass FIR filter. So it's a finite impulse response. Uh, they're reliant on the current and at previous input samples, so x of n. That's the only things that the output signal is reliant on. Uh, this is a first order, because we're only using one previous sample. This can go into the hundreds. Um, the orders can get quite big. But obviously, I'm going to talk about positive and negative for that now, actually. Um, well, no, I'm not. I'm going to scale with more maths. Um, there's a really nice online visualizer for this as well. Um, what I wanted to do with this math equation basically showing you, the only thing that's changed here is this bk is the coefficient. I wanted to show you that because we can use an array to store all these, or we can manipulate just the coefficients, and we can do stuff like that. All right. I'll show you the online visual in a minute. So this is what I wanted to get to, pros and cons. So it's easy, it's stable, and robust. And I'm going to go into what stability means a bit later with complex numbers. I mean, obviously, if you're storing all of those previous samples, you're going to have a really large storage requirement on these things. So FIR filters are considered to not be quite, they're accurate, but not considered to be super useful on big productions and stuff. They're computationally expensive, and you can't actually simulate analog filters. I'm not going to simulate analog filters today, but you can't do that with an FIR filter. So I'm just going to show you the visualizer quickly. If you guys want to have a play with this, uh, I can share the link on Discord a little later, obviously. Um, but this basically just lets you plug in some arbitrary numbers, have a little faff around with it, and you can see your life's frequency response, impulse response, and step response. And we, don't, and we even get the coefficients if you wanted to copy and paste these into MATLAB. Uh, we change the sampling rate. Didn't even write that correctly. Well done, me. And yeah, and we can see. <laughs> see? And we've got a band pass. So have a little play with that at your own leisure while I'm talking. By all means, go for it. Um, it's just a nice little visualizer, because I'm not going to implement an FIR today. All right, cool. So that's an FIR filter. What I want you to take away is we're relying on current and previous input samples. So what happens if we change that? What happens if we rely on the previous output samples as well? What do you think happens? So yeah, this is the definition. Uh, as you can see, all I've done to the difference equation is add that 0.2y n to the minus 1. So what we're doing there is taking the previous sample every single time, adding it to our new output sample. Um, and that's pretty much it for that first one. It's going to get a bit more complicated now. So this is going to be the second order. 
Remember when I said earlier we can swap out the numbers and put in letters? That's what I've done here. So we've got A0, A1, A2, and obviously B1 and B2 on the y of n's. What I've done is equaled the y's to the x's, so we can just see how that looks. So what we're doing here is relying on the previous two inputs and the previous two outputs. Um, it's pretty neat. So how do we find the impulse response of this? We do the exact same thing again. <laughs> we put in the z's. Uh, we use our transfer function equation. And we get this grim looking thing. But this is a very common, this is a very important, if you take anything from my filters equation, take this equation. This is uh, used a lot. This is called a biquadratic filter. So we've got squares on the numerator and the denominator. So is, that, is everyone following me? So that's the top, that's the bottom, numerator, denominator. We've got z to the minus 2 on both sides. Uh, and that's where the by prefix comes from, basically. So these are chained together, generally, to make EQs. Uh, and they're pretty important. I, I used one in one of my university assignments last year, actually, and it was all right. It was decent. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. So, um, we saw the the difference equation before that had the one sample of delay. So it was taking the in, one sample of the input and then um, the previous sample of the input and adding them together. So that one was one sample of delay. And this is what specifies something called the filter order. And the order of the filter is uh, the number of um, samples of delay, the maximum number of samples of delay that it has. So in this one, we've got a maximum uh, filter order of two, because we can see that our maximum delay is two, minus two. And uh, what the filter order determines is how fast the roll-off is after our frequency cutoff. And for higher filter orders, we're going to have a faster roll-off in what we call the transition band. Um, so like a steeper filter cutoff. Exactly, yeah. Exactly right, yeah. So you can define, when you look at the filter on a graph, I'll go over this later, you can define how it's looking and how you change that with, say, the order or the cutoff, and that will affect how the filter looks, obviously, naturally. All right, let's carry on. I'm only going to briefly mention poles and zeros because this is where it gets complex. Um, the problem we have with an infinite impulse response filter is there's a lot of uh, rounding errors, and things tend towards infinity. Uh, and as you can imagine, that's going to cause some weird blips. If, you, if I plug in a filter that isn't stable, we're going to have different things shoot off. Maybe I've got a visualize, visualization of it. There we go. Um, here. Here and here there's the poles and the zeros of an unstable system. And what that means is your computer won't like it. You'll get some weird clicks and stuff. And that's not great when you're trying to produce or build a VST. So it's just something to keep in mind. IR filters are unstable. Um, we will plot that, what that looks like in a unit circle later. Um, yeah. Let's keep going. So this is some pros and cons, as I was basically saying. So the biggest pro between a finite impulse response and an infinite impulse response is the fact that there are fewer parameters, less memory requirement, and a lower computational complexity. And that, as audio devs, is what we need, right? We need as much space as possible. Uh, like I said, if you don't look after your coefficients, the IR filters become unstable, and that causes problems. There is also, it's technically a feedback loop, right? Because you're feeding the signal back. So you're getting accumulating rounding and noise errors, generally you do with a feedback loop. So you have to acclimatize for that and make sure that it, you're working at a high enough order so it doesn't affect your filter. We did it in 20 minutes, guys. Well done. <laughs> Let's implement an IIR filter. All right. So if you guys can navigate to the GitHub repo, I'm sure you've already done it. Uh, I'm going to try and live code it because I'm feeling spicy. But um, the after, everything. after everything you went through, yeah. <laughs> The first one we're going to look at is the IIR plot. So if you guys want to get that up, I'm going to talk through it and attempt to live code it so we can take a bit more of a breakdown. So I take this, check it over there. Oh, look, it's MATLAB. Woo and we've got a blank screen. So my MATLAB scripts are a lot 
that's filled in, Rachel, so it's not going to take as long. But what I wanted to show you is you can play with these numbers that I'm going to plug in. So the first thing I would suggest doing for any MATLAB script is clearing the variables that are stored. As Rachel said, you'll see a list of vari variables appear here, and that can cause problems when it, if you don't reload and clear, it will. if you've changed a variable parameter or you've changed the function, it'll keep what was kept previously, which is uh, what I was saying to Rachel. So yeah, let's add that. So we're doing CLC and then clear. So CLC is clearing the screen. Or the other end, doesn't matter. And clear all is clearing the console. So remember before when we had the filter up and it was uh, we had the numerator and the denominator. We had our Z points. So what I'm going to do now is just store those in an array. So we've got a numerator. It's really weird doing this on the side screen. Um, so, can you see that MATLAB's like highlighted our equal sign? So this is what I was saying before in our housekeeping, basically. If I were to run that script now, in fact I will, it prints out at the bottom there, command window. So it's, it's, it's actually warning you that you're going to print out that array if you don't suppress it like that. And see, it's disappeared now. Uh, so just, yeah, keep that in mind when you're playing with this later. Otherwise you'll get like a really long array of things, and you're like, what does this mean? OK, and there's a denominator. These values are changeable. I would implore you to change them to see what happens to the signal. So let's plot our figure. Figure one, it's good to give figure names, so you can do multiple windows at once if you want. So this will be figure one. If I wanted to, I could do figure two and have like a different, fre uh, different frequency response or something, and then you can put them together and be like, oh, what's changed? What's What's new? Uh, you don't want to suppress that because you want that to print, so don't suppress that with the semicolon. One, three, one. So that's telling MATLAB, that one, three, one, that we want three different graphs, uh, sorry, in a row like that. Uh, and this is going to be the first one. All right, so we're going to do that, that Z plane again. And all we need to do now is plug in the numerator and the denominator. Looks good to me. And let's title that. Now this is going to be the poll zero plot. Uh, if we let's slide that now. Okay, cool. Oh yeah, of course it's opened on my screen here. <laughs> Here's the first plot. So this is what I was talking about earlier with stability. Uh, what I want you to take away here is that we've got our poles and zeros. This little circle and this little x are our poles and zeros, and they're inside this thing called the unit circle. Therefore, we consider the filter to be stable. So we're not going to see things shooting off to infinity. You're not going to have those weird distortion clips and blips and stuff like that. So that's what you're looking for when you're doing this thing. And yeah, change the numerator and denominator. See, see what happens. See if you can get it outside of the unit circle. You've produced an unstable filter. Woohoo! Go for it. All right. Let's do the uh, next bit now. So we're going to do the frequency response now. So that's the first bit. Let's do. I'm going to define omega between zero and pi. I'm going to do thirty-two values between that. How does that look? That looks good to me. And then we're just going to type this out and explain it. And again, suppress that. And then magnitude is equal to the absolute value of h, h if you're Right, cool. So we're using an inbuilt MATLAB filter, um, yeah, function, I guess. It's called freak Z, And that's what we're using to go and get the frequency response from that Z domain. I've asked for the absolute value, so we're not getting weird plots, uh, as Rachel explained earlier. And we're going to grab the phase as well. And 
that's all we need to plot the frequency response is the magnitude and phase, obviously. So we're going to subplot. One, three, two. And then we're going to plot. So I'm using that omega over pi to make the x-axis. So we've got the same sized arrays. Let's label it. Let's just call it magnitude. All right. And then we obviously don't want to plot magnitude and phase on the same graph. We can do if you want. Wouldn't recommend it. Plot omega pi and the face. All right. And then let's title that. So that is. Have I made any errors? Is this going to run first time? Take your bets now. Well, hey, look at that. First time, a live code went well. And we can see here our filter response. That's the magnitude and that's the phase. So have you guys got the code ready? Are you guys able to play with that? Do you guys want like a couple minutes to try it out and see if you can break it and stuff? Should we break for five minutes and do that? All right. Give that a go. I'll change some numbers here on the screen as well so the people online can see what we're doing. Does, ever, does anyone have any questions for me either? Free to take questions. Can you, can you pull up the plots and describe what you're saying on sure. each of the plots? Like what are the axes and what, sure. what are we looking at here? Let me put some numbers back on. So what we're looking at is a complex number. So what that means is, I'll just do a quick, uh, in audio, numbers are complex. So what we're saying is they have a value on an x-axis and a y-axis. And this is the real bit. And this is imaginary as I'm sure some of you are aware. So when we say the number one, number one would be here, and we would say it doesn't have an imaginary portion. Obviously, we're talking about complex numbers here. So we might have a value here, for example. So that would be, say, one, and that would have a value of j or i, depending on if you're an engineer or not. So how we get to that point, there's two ways you can get to that point, basically. So you can come across here, come to the one, and then come up like that. So you're taking the length of the x and the y-axis, or you do that and take that. So what you're doing is taking angle. So this is what we're looking at here, phase. Uh, let me call that theta. So when we're representing this number, you'll see it, Euler's identity, ej theta we're defining the line and we're defining the angle basically. So what you're looking for in the filter is how to get to that. Um, so we're looking at how this is affected over time. All right, so I'm just going to pull you back to the MATLAB code so I can show that a little bit better. So as you can see here, phase, we're taking that angle and that's what's being printed out there. And then magnitude is the absolute value. So what we're doing is we're not shooting off into a negative. Again, because of Nyquist, we know that there's a negative value attached to. So by taking the absolute value, we're only getting that portion here instead of going like opposite down to here instead. So that would be what would happen if we didn't absolute it, basically. So we only want this bit because, you know, we're not bothered about negative numbers uh, in the same way. All right, I think we've uh, exhausted that one. <laughs> Let's actually get some audio playing then. Um, what I'm going to do now is show you how to read an audio file in MATLAB. Um, as you've probably seen, the code isn't as long because we're not trying to plot. So I'm going to use a built-in IIR filter that MATLAB uses called a Butterworth filter. And we're not going over Windows or anything today. So I'm just going to quickly add some bits. 
audio. So when we want to read audio in MATLAB, we use this thing called Audio Read. Uh, as you can see, my audio file is called Lo-Fi Demo. So what MATLAB does there is take the... I'm going to clear as well. Takes our audio and stores it in a really long double vector um, array. And it's also got the frequency at which it was sampled at. So that's what the audio read function in MATLAB does. And it's really nice and useful, because that means we can then access those values and do some changes. Uh, OK. So remember how I was saying before, or how Rachel mentioned, that we can define a filter based on the properties of it. So where we want it to attenuate by three decibels, also known as the cutoff frequency, uh, and how Big the transition band is. So what I've defined here is where we're going to cut it off originally. 800 obviously is quite low, so we're going to hear basically not a lot of what I've got left. <laughs> but that's on purpose, so you can actually hear it working. Uh, okay. And let's just do the... This is the inbuilt busworth filter that I was talking about. Two. That's good. So that's the inbuilt that I want you guys to use. And then once again, we're going to plot just so we can see what's happening. Uh, so that's so what that's done is actually stored the values of B and A, those coefficients I was talking about in the numerator and denominator. We go back to that. That's what that's doing. So what we need to do now is actually tell it to apply that to the signal, to our input signal, the lo-fi demo. So what we've done there is just calculate some coefficients, which is the IIR portion of what we're talking about. So I'm going to call this filtered single, and then we're going to use another inbuilt function called filter. That is now filtered. But we're not going to hear anything, are we? Because all we've done is change those numbers. So what we need to do is actually play the sound now. So we use a player. And then we need to tell it what we actually want it to play, which is the filtered signal and how fast or how to play it back. So that's the F of S. That's the uh, sample rate. All right. And let's play it. Haha, <laughs> keeping on your news, what have I done wrong? So you can use sound. You can use sound. <laughs> ah, the old lowercase, yeah. Thanks, guys. That'll be my bad naming habits. That's one thing I think I always struggle with. There we go. And can you hear it's quite low? You'll hear it now, it's sort of muffled, right? So we've done it. We've filtered a signal with an IIR filter. So what happens if I change this? If I change it to, say, 20,000, Quite high. Obviously, that's right at the edge of what we actually hear, so you won't really hear anything happening. Um, let's run that. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. This is basically the original for everyone listening. So now you can hear that hi hat, it's very tinny. <laughs> um, but that, that allows you to do some really interesting things. So, what you can do is chain a few of those together to make, say, a three band EQ. So you can use that to boost or attenuate your signal. Um, yeah. Has everyone got this code available to them? Do people want to try and change the cutoff a little bit and see what we can get going? Has everyone got a sample ready? Like yeah. Well, go for it. We're at an audio conference. We might as well play it, right? <laughs> yeah. Everyone's like, oh, is this working? Yeah. So give it a go. Let me know if you have any issues yeah. playing with that. All right. Nice one. And we've got 10 minutes spare for questions as well. Look at that. Mm -hmm. 
So I, when I defi I'll show you. When I defined it, when I defined it, when I called it, I capitalised the P because obviously, good practice to do that for the second. But you need to lowercase it because that's how it's defined in MATLAB. Yeah. So, could you talk a little bit about what, cool. if you were to write the filter function yourself, yeah. what that would look like? Sure, sure. What it actually does. I can pull out an example for you. Yeah, yeah, applying the difference equation. Yeah. Mm -mm. Just pulling out my example for you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where that's coming from. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Hang right, well, on, let me just pull this window back so I can actually see what's happening. Let me just pull that up for you so you guys can look at that while I'm playing. I don't think I've ever actually done it like point by point because no, 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 no. It's it's a great question and it's. I could like do a little thing on the board. If you want to, yeah, sure, yeah, I can give you that. Sound. If you remember that uh, Harriet was saying that our um, difference equation is something like for a first order filter, like so. This is our output signal y of n square brackets for the digital representation and independent variable n is, I think we had 0 0.5 for our coefficients, uh, 0 0.5 times x of n. Sorry, this is really small. Um, plus 0 0.5 times. So whenever in mathematics we see something just alongside something here. It generally means times, but it's not written in a lot of textbooks. Hmm. So that will mean this is multiplied by 0 0.5 if it's next to it here. Uh, and, and this will be our delay, n minus 1. So what you're going to do if you want to apply this filter to an input signal, let's say you have an input signal x of n. And basically what this difference equation is telling you is that our output signal is 0 0.5 times our whatever value we have at that n. Sorry, that should be lowercase n. So n is just a sample number, right? It's just an index. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera. So we're going to bring our signal in sample by sample. We're going to grab the first sample of our signal. And we're going to say, OK, what's going to be the output? What's going to be y of n? So what's going to be the first sample of our output is going to be the first sample of our input signal plus the previous sample of our input signal. Now, that's going to be difficult to do for the first sample because we don't actually have a previous sample. So that's what I was saying about MATLAB indexing from one. And sometimes you have to start from, maybe you'd start, you might put this in a for loop and that's how you're going to apply it. So you're going to loop through. Uh, a loop is just a piece of code that runs a block of code a certain number of predefined times. So you might want to run your for loop for however many samples your input signal has, because you want to feed your whole input signal through to gain your, your output signal. So until you run out of samples, you want to take sample by sample and say, OK, let's say start from sample 2 in MATLAB. Um, 
So it would be like x of 2 because we need the previous one that would be x of 1, right? So we'd say y of 0 equals, uh, and we'd have to write some conditional because we want it to be y of 0, but we want to grab our, in, our input signal from 2 because we want to take. Another thing you could do is like add some zero padding on the beginning. So you have some zeros before your signal starts so that there's just some like placeholder values there. So when you start applying your filter, this actually exists because n minus one has to exist. And it, if you're in your first index of your signal, then n minus one doesn't currently exist. Um, yeah, and then you can have more, like if you had a second order filter, you might have um, like maybe a different coefficient out in front. And then you would have x of n minus 2. And I guess with what I was saying about adding some zeros to the beginning, the amount of zeros that you have to add would be determined by like what your maximum delay was, which is your filter order. So this is a this is a finite impulse response filter with an order of two. And um, yeah, as Harriet was saying, if it was an infinite info impulse response filter, you would also be feeding back in values of your output. So you'd be, there's a lot going on because you'd be calculating your output, but then your output would rely also on previous values of your output not just previous values of your input signal. Um, yeah, I can write out a, a for loop which applies uh, this and add it to the GitHub if anyone's interested. Does anyone have any questions about what I just drew up? Sorry if it's a bit small. Looks good. Going back to, to your point of the yeah. infinite or IIMR, being the less uh, expensive, mm -hmm. um, how trying to convert that into, into code and sort of memory allocation in my head, how, how is that? <laughs> because you're not having to store all of the previous inputs. Um, how do I explain this well? So basically, you're going, you're going to need all of your output samples to play the sample back, so you're already storing that. So if you can just access that, and go back, then you're not storing two big arrays. Basically, you, you, you're cutting it down to being that one array that you're going to need for playback anyway and applying it there, basically. So you can cut down on how many previous sort of... As, you, as Rachel was saying, if you do it point-wise multiplication on the X of N, you need to store every single version of that, but you're going to store that anyway for playback for Y of N. So that's why it's a bit less. Yeah, any more questions? Okay, so that's the end of our workshop, guys. Um, apologies, the filters was a bit rushed. <laughs> we we're running out of time. But if you have any questions, please feel free to come over and chat to me a little bit. We can play with the MATLAB a bit more. Maybe I can explain magnitude a bit more by pointing to it a bit better. Um, and yeah, thank you for your time today. It's been really uh, helpful to appreciate your feedback and everything. So. Yeah, keep pinging us on Discord with questions and stuff. Um, I'll be around for the next few days, as will Rachel and Anna. So, yeah, I'll see you out there. Uh, yeah, so go have a good lunch. Thanks, thanks. All right.